machine is so the rubber boots on the on the joysticks and that doesn't tell you anything it gives me something to fiddle with that's it <laughs> deal with your soul yeah become the rov megan sorry to interrupt your fishing but speaking of sea critters um so the Deep sea critters, do they have a special body structure to be able to withstand all the atmospheric pressure? Um, well, I mean, most of these animals are uh, have hydrostatic skeletons, which means that their skeleton is made out of water, or their tissues are also mostly water. So in, in a lot of these deep sea fishes have a lot of water in their tissue, and water is not, com not compressible in the same way that air is compressible. So they don't really need to have special structures. But uh, if you were to bring a fish up from a deep depth to the surface, you would notice a change in that, that fish's uh, body because of the change in pressure. And that's why uh, the blobfish you guys might be familiar with looks the way it does when it's brought up from depth. It's actually a normal looking fish in its natural environment, um, kind of cute. But when you bring it up from depth, it starts to bloat the tissues because there's no longer that pressure keeping the, that fish in its natural shape. So, yeah, there there are some adaptations, and the fishes are just used to being at that pressure. But in terms of, like, our starfish and corals, when we bring them up, them up there is no uh, morphological change that we notice from what it looks like in situ. So at the bottom of the ocean when we're collecting it and, or when we bring it into our lab. So basically, well, I, I was going to say that the deep sea critters are more like um, uh, fancy water balloons, but humans are mostly water, right? We're just fancy sacks of water. Yeah, we are pretty fancy. We also have lots of sacks of air, which make it very difficult for us to go really deep down in the ocean because our air sacks, which are very important to our living, uh, will get compressed. I do like having my air sacs <laughs> nice and uncompressed. Pardon me. <laughs> air sacs. Everybody has, well, not everybody. Most people have two. In their ears or what? Air sac. Lungs. Your lungs. Mm. <laughs> and if you ever have a collapsed lung, you'll know it because it's awful. I've never had one, but I... It I'm, definitely sounds awful. Yeah. Not on my list of things to do. No. Nope. However, if you have a collapsed lung, you can make an incision and put a straw in and have someone. Uh, that would be like emergency situation, like you're in the mountains and going to die. Just yeah, that. it sounds like yeah. something you'd see on House. Yeah. <laughs> I think they've definitely done that. MacGyvering up a chest tube out of nowhere. Ooh, salt normally helps humans retain water, so how do fish and other sea animals maintain hydration balance when they live in such a salty environment? Do fish have to drink? Oh, that's a that's a good question. That's a physiology question, and a number of animals have different methods to deal with um, the saltiness. So a lot of fish will actively pump water, um, you might be a shark that actually has a very salty, um, like just keeps a, a balance with the salt. So that's why my shark tissue can isn't really a, a good thing to eat a lot of because of the content. Uh, I'm not, not the best person to ask about this because the, I took this class a really long time ago and I'm having a hard time remembering all the information. I've got all this taxonomy information uh, and it's hard to dredge up that physiology uh, information from my memory warehouse here right now. But uh, yeah, there there are a lot of different tactics um, to deal with the saltiness of the ocean. I did not know that shark meat was salty though. It's like naturally salinated. Yeah, and then like some shark meats have other compounds in it that aren't. Um, good for humans. So like, I think the, the Greenland shark. Um, no, I would not eat that. Yeah, they, you have to like ferment it uh, to make it so it won't kill you when you eat it. 
I, I saw an episode on like bizarre foods. Wait, were you saying that that's supposed to be good for us? It's not. It's not necessarily good for you, but it's something um, that people eat. Yeah. Traditional food. Uh, I'm not sure who was the one who figured out that you know all you got to do is ferment it for a really long time in, in order to make it digestible. I mean, it's like a 200-year-old shark, so I bet that meat's a little interesting. It definitely bioaccumulates, so that means like anything that um, a top predator might eat accumulates in its tissues. So um, that's why they caution you against eating a lot of like tuna and fish because of mercury, because whatever those fish are eating, uh, the fish that those fish are eating are also eating things in the environment and, and you just sort of get this accumulation of toxins in there top was, predators. There's a commercial, I don't remember the brand, but uh, the little tagline was, you are what you eat, eat. Yep. So what you eat and then what the animal that you eat, eats. That's why plastic pollution is kind of really scary because I don't know if everyone knows, but there's this thing called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and they think that this is similar and other, there's five gyres and it's like, so they think that there's other places where there's this large assortment where the gyre, the ocean circulation causes this patch of patch quote, garbage patch of plastic in the middle of the ocean. And um, it's kind of a big problem because uh, it's actually ending up in salt now. So a lot of salts that we eat now also contain microplastics. Um, it's almost everywhere. So even if you don't eat seafood, and so you're like, oh, I don't have to worry about plastics in my seafood. Well, now you can worry because it's in your salt as well. Um, now you can worry. Now you can worry. And, uh, you know, especially microplastics because of the surface area can hold up, a, can hold a large amount of toxins and the chemistry and of talk of uh, plastic allows them to absorb a lot of toxins that are in the ocean environment. Um, so just be aware of that. And then also you can be aware of what sort of organisms you're eating. So you're going to have more issues if you're eating the whole organism, like an oyster or a clam, as opposed to eating just the flesh of like a fish or something. I refuse to eat clams. Their output is too close to their input. I, it's not okay. Um, do we have a more specific schedule for our actual dives? Uh, we do, although sometimes the weather prevents us from sticking to that perfect schedule. So things can change on a dime at sea, so that's why we don't necessarily... Oh, we caught a jelly. Now that's why we uh, sometimes a dive isn't when you expect it to be. It's like a little later on. Yeah, that might have been a uh, uh, larvation. I've seen a number of larvations. Uh, they're hard to spot because uh, they make these little houses uh, that they use to filter seawater and filter that um, marine snow. And uh, when they get clogged up, they'll they'll abandon their houses and make a new one. And this happens, I think, every other day or so that they make a new house. And when it gets too dirty, they're just like, oh, no not dealing with this, and they just make a new house, and they move in. Um, but they're pretty fun little animals. Other animals you might see uh, are like salps, uh, hydromedusa, siphonophores, uh, ketonaths, uh, one of the, the most abundant uh, vertebrate on the planet is a fish called cyclothony. It is a bristle, bristle mouth fish. They are elongate and have uh, lots of really tiny, teeny tiny sharp teeth in their mouth, hence the name bristle mouth. Uh, that little one that just popped up on the screen. We have a very fancy telestrator now that used to be used for football games. I mean, not, yeah, not this telestrator. Yeah, it's good for like, you know, giving directions. So like, I just want you to go there. That's so cool. It's so cool. There's so many fun little things to do. You can point out something. It's really hard when the 
thing you're pointing out, though, is moving. Can you keep dragging it as you point it? Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh there you go. That's okay. the hot beans. It disappears after, like, five seconds. So we're counting how many uh, jellies we can spot. I like this freeze zoom function. If I'm really fast, I might be able to, like, capture something before it disappears. Whoa, oh, no. That's not right. Oh, boy. Figure it out, Trev. There we go. It's good when I make the same mistake twice in a row. That's how you know I'm crushing it. About how far off the bottom is Herc right now? Do we know? Of course we know. I don't know. I have I no idea. Know. And Never we don't mind. have uh, altitude right yeah, now. Actually, that's, I know. that's, that's actually I a looked. really hard question <laughs> right now. <laughs> Over 200 meters. How about that? Yeah. That's why I looked at the data. I was like, oh, I don't have that data. Well, I'm going to ask a question. Yeah, uh, it's a tough question. First question is, where is Herc? <laughs> Back there somewhere. Nope, nope. We know exactly where Herc is, right? I, yeah. I think nope. exactly is a big word. That's a very strong word for such a nebulous concept. Uh, what are we looking for in the water column? Uh, we are just exploring this area in general. Um, we are in the water column. We're higher up in midwater because we are transiting from one area to the next. And uh, so we are going to get to our destination eventually. Yeah, it looks like the ship has moved to the position that we're looking for. So now we just have to wait to catch up. No, we're indeed we're holding position, waiting for the vehicles to fall into position. All the ladies in the house, quick lock the door, Josh can't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is the whole van like this? Yeah. Oh, he Josh, ruined it. Turn around. <laughs> Get out of here. No, you're hey, not. It's all ladies up there. You're ruining it, Josh. We did the whole the van. The entire van. Oh. Josh, go eat dinner. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> We've got this. <laughs> Uh, well, those are 200 meter blocks now, so we got some time. <laughs> it's all relative. Yeah, so we are winning compared to that for sure. Not without a struggle. And for a very short but amazing period of time. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. Slowly but surely. Oh, I'm trying to catch the fish and, and jellies. It's kind of hard. They move by too fast. I feel like you do this every time there's blue water. <laughs> it's it's keeping me focused and on task. Also, I promised Aaron that there would be stuff to look at. Film. Great. We do have a few viewers who are saying yay for a female-dominated van. <laughs> Not Sorry, even no. dominated. It was like the whole thing. It was the full thing. Whole, whole whole van. Van. Well, now it's still dominated. Now it's dominated. <laughs> you're, you're okay, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy you're here. <laughs> okay, so... I'm comfortable in my own skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we were struggling trying to 
get to the waypoint on step, so Captain came on, changed heading, and we just kind of steamed over at one and a half knots. Oh, wow, well, okay. Not, start, no, not steamed over, DP'd over, but at a pretty good speed, a good clip. Um, he's now holding position, and we're just waiting for the vehicles to, to fall out. Just went for it, hey? Yeah. Cool. That was a good choice. Um, and we had him stopped at least 100 meters off that waypoint. That waypoint depth is 2781, so you should be at least like 70 meters deeper, maybe even closer to 100 meters deeper where our ship is now. Um, okay, yeah. and once that's we great. Settle a bit, we can move in closer if you want, or awesome. whatever you guys like. Nice work. Looks like he's just doing some heading change stuff now. So when you guys were going 1.5, um, did Herc have trouble keeping up, or were they did they do pretty good? Um, Trevor didn't mention it, so I think okay. it was I think it was good. Okay, awesome. And when he's driving, like, straight ahead, like, he has less trouble controlling the ship? Apparently. As opposed to backing down? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The end of one says yes. And we had great USBL. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. As we drag the vehicles through the water. <laughs> yeah. It's perfect. <laughs> exactly when you need it. Yep. Huh. Exactly when I know kind of where they are. Yeah, they don't totally. Have a choice. <laughs> yeah, totally. We did not when we were backing down. So that wash over the Roger. With the deucer was making a problem. Gabby or Josh, uh, we have a question from a viewer asking if you ever do descents with the lights, without any lights on, with the ROVs, I guess, to maybe see if there's any bioluminescence in the water. Then occasional uh, times where we just like turn them off for a short period for, for various reasons. Um, but in normal situations, just operational situations, we want to keep the lights on just because it helps us keep an eye on one another. Descending without your lights on might be something you did if you had a battery-operated vehicle, like an AUV or something. When you get to the seafloor, you want to take pictures, you'd turn your lights on again. Um, but to save battery, yeah, you would turn the lights off when you're not actually needing to do any visual surveys. My first year on board, we had a bioluminescence camera, like a low light camera. Oh, um, cool. But we'd still turn the lights on and off at different times during mm. going down. We wouldn't have them off the entire time. Just when you wanted to? Like yeah, we'd have camera. like little periods of time where they'd have all the lights off. That's cool. And you did it during like the the vertical transect? Not the whole, not the whole one. They just okay. did it for like here and there during it. Cool. Oh boy. <laughs> that was a fun one. Is he falling off station? Or did you call no, him? He's, he's just turning around. Yeah, oh, okay. he put in a heading change. Okay. So Thanks. I hope it sorts itself out, but I got an eye on it. Okay.
In what way? Oh, the heading change? Yeah. The jet's working pretty hard right now. There's a viewer, Jack, who's wondering if when you're not on shift, can you go visit the bridge? Uh, yeah, you can, if you want to. Uh, they welcome anyone up there. What you're seeing on channel three is one of their views out of, out of the bridge, so uh, you can kind of see what they see. But yeah, our crew is uh, really open to anyone going up to the bridge and seeing what they're doing. Still haven't seen any good jellies yet. I know they're out there. <laughs> You come down a bit if you want. We're still more than 200 meters off the bottom. Okay. If you wanted to. Um, yeah. Let's. Uh, am I using? It? Let me make sure I'm not using up all my jam here. Yeah, I got some to work with. Sure. Let's go down. There's a thing. Try slow at first. Okay. Between 10 and 15. All right. You need to be faster with your your marking. I know. It's work, like the moment I recognize it as something, it's gone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And usually the things I see are in like the edges.
Would that the be bottom. it? Bottom. Two. Yeah. Two hundred. Yeah. Yeah. We're going down right now. So. Do you want us to kind of hold here until we uh, get more into the spot? Okay, we can hold here. Now at least we know the bottom is 200 away. You might have recently answered this, but how long until we get to the next point? Um. Maybe, what, 20 minutes? We're still settling out. Um, the ship recently made a, a heading change, and we still have to come back down to bottom. Mm. So we, we've got a little bit of time yet before we are ready to take another look at the seafloor and make our way up to the summit of this seamount. Just hang with us and be patient. The blue water can be mesmerizing and beautiful, but I know everybody's itching to see the bottom again. I know I am. I love seeing the bottom. There's so many of the things I enjoy down there, but the water column can be quite interesting too. And uh, the density of organisms that we see yep. changes with depth. It. So um, what's the, uh, bearing our current be? depth looks like 2,794 two, meters. Two, which is, is pretty deep to be seeing um, a lot of really big, dense stuff in the water column, but you never know. Uh, I haven't exclusively studied the water column. Uh, I've only participated in, in a couple water column uh, surveys, which I had experts on the line pointing out things that I didn't even see. So my eye isn't quite trained to, to find all these little things that might be here. Usually it's those big jellies and siphonophores that really stand out. Yeah, it looks like a hundred. But there are a lot of smaller organisms like copepods and uh, ketonaths that we might be missing. And we're also moving quite fast. Oh the yeah, water you just did it exactly backwards. Just head. to get to where we're going. So that makes it really difficult to, to really survey this area in the way it deserves. How much do you know about white tip sharks? How much do I know? Um, I know that we have a lot in this area. Uh, They're often attracted to our ship, especially in the evening time. We saw uh, two outside. Yeah? But I thought they we were commenting on, we thought that they were solitary. Um, so there was two. Yeah, usually they are pretty solitary, but um, I have noticed that we've seen them in, in small groups, uh, especially if there are, is food available. So say in the evening time when we have the A-frame out and the lights better. on, we get a lot of squid attracted to those lights and the sharks might all come and start feeding. But generally they do rel live relatively solitary lifestyles. Um, they don't Usually move okay. in Sounds groups great. or that'll get us very close. Of, of more We're about than one. Looks like hundred and eighty meters But they always seem off. to have a little entourage of fish following them. And I've always wondered how often the shark gets hungry and snacks on one of its little buddies, or if they just don't eat the fish that follow them because there's a. Uh, because fish some are so friends, not food. Because fish <laughs> are friends, and not food, or only only some fish are food. I don't know. That's, that's about all I know about the white tip oceanic sharks. Well, before coming up here, we saw two and also a mahi mahi. Awesome. Yeah, we do have some nice sized mahi mahi. It was around pretty here. good, yeah. It was cool to see them all together. Mm -hmm. The mahi mahi are really fast. Mahi Mahi also love to eat squid. It's one of their favorite snacks. In the past when uh, we've caught Mahi, we can uh, open up the stomachs and see what they've eaten. It's a really good way to survey 
what the food web, web is like and uh, what, um, what these the animals are eating. And uh, it, it's pretty cool um, to be able to, I mean, I think some people are really good at identifying I don't think we're gonna little like, things that We'll do the 100 meters the and then like, when we get close to the end, call in the next bit. I don't think, yeah, I agree. I, mean, I don't think we'll need we to We can stop. hit the seafloor anywhere along on the way, that's fine. Because we're, we're already set up, all we got to do is just go down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. You can just watch the seafloor, like, come meet us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so back row, just an update. Uh, we're getting, we got settled in. Uh, a ship's starting to move, making set moves towards waypoint seven. And as we approach it, uh, Gabby and Josh will come down and get us situated. Sounds like a good plan. About how long will that take? Um, the step move into the waypoint will probably take about twenty minutes. Okay. Maybe a little more. At any point, we can start heading down, though, and meet the seafloor as well. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, it takes us a little bit longer to move when we're on the seafloor. Um, but I guess the, the key thing is to get as much time on the seafloor as possible and make tracks up to the summit. Okay. Yeah, roger that. Right now, the seafloor is about 150 meters away. Okay. Let it get a little closer, and then we'll try and meet up with it.
Just starting to get a little Doppler here and there. For those of you who have just tuned in, we are still off the coast of Hawaii. Um, and there's a question about uh, our home dock. We are not returning to San Pedro for a little bit. We're going to be um, we're going to be in Honolulu uh, for at least a few years. Are you ready for a fish joke? Yeah. Why did the fish get poor grades in school? Oh, I know this one. Now just tell me. Because it was below sea level. Now mm. see, I walked up here from my meal and saw <laughs> puns in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> so why are there puns in the chat? There must be a reason. <laughs> Found my reason. Come to find out. There's a reason for everything. Oi, oi, oi. Um, how many meter? Oh, so how many meters total is this uh, traverse? Uh, how many kilometers do we did we plan on? I think it was. You mean I think it was four k total? Okay. Four kilometers. We had um, is that right? Three point eight um, for the first part um, to the first seamount flank. Then we had a transect midwater of three point seven kilometers, and then the second part of this uh, dive track is about two hundred. 2,800 okay. meters, so all in all, quite long. Quite, right, and this is all the same seamount? Yeah, yeah, so we hit that kind of localized, smaller summit. I, To us, to me, it's the same seamount. <laughs> and then we uh, went over the big valley, and now we're going to head up the, the seamount proper, the main seamount. Is this one a little bit longer than the ones so we've been seeing? pretty or? long. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, going on 10 kilometers, all in all. Oh, wow. A wide boy. Definitely covering some ground. And the direction is to do it all, no matter how long it takes. Okay. Right. We could be out here for weeks, months <laughs> even. Oh gosh, I hope not. For the rest of our lives, surveying this one seamount. No, seam my out. dog misses me. <laughs> What did the fish say when the eels crashed the party? It's electric boogie again. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the more, the merrier. Okay. I don't know. I just feel like the eel would. I don't know if they should be welcome. Ooh. I caught one. Oh, cute. It's so small. Oh, and Aaron's not here to see it. Um, how fast do the ROVs descend? 30 units, right? 30 units. I don't 30 know. units <laughs> per unit. Uh, wait, wait. 30 meters per 30 minute. 30 per units per hour. 30 <laughs> meters 30 per minute. 30 furlongs per micro fortnight. <laughs> or 30 meters a minute. Okay, yeah, that. That's right. the one. Right, right, right. Um, we asked Trevor uh, what the, uh, how much pressure the arm could make. How much force. There we go. Oh, goodness. The, the, the. Dinner is slowing my brain down. And his answer was one to nine. <laughs> one to nine, that's one right. One to nine beans. And, and what is the unit It's actually more that? like three to nine. Because like <laughs> one to three doesn't even count. Yeah, he said that <laughs> one, if you tried to squeeze a can with one, it wouldn't actually crush it. Like a uh, one, even, it doesn't even close. I don't think it even closes jaw. Yeah, it's, that's zero. One is actually zero. Yeah, one and three equals zero. Three to nine is the force. Yeah, it's, three. it's definitely <laughs> three, three to nine. I'm, I'm with Josh on three to nine. <laughs> and it's beans is the unit. Beans. All right. It could probably create, I'd say at full force, though, it could it could probably do uh, a couple hundred PSI, I would say. Let's not Kay. get scientific yeah. about it. I believe you. 
It's strong. You, you want what it. The Manuel says. Yeah. You want to stay out of its way, basically. Oh yeah, it would. It would hurt. It would take your finger off. Yeah. So somebody is challenging my math skills. How many fathoms deep are we? Answer being. They do have the internet. Half, half as fathom. many, yeah, half as many as we are meters. Yeah. One thousand five hundred and twenty-eight fathoms. Ah 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 ah. More things should be measured in fathoms, really. <laughs> really, what you want to know is how many cables deep we are, because that's you know, but depending who, you, which navy you talk to. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Which navy are you talking to? I don't know. <laughs> that's classified. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The history of the cable as a unit is very weird. Isn't there's a good one for anchor chain too? What's that? What's that one? Not sure uh, that one. Uh, shots or something like that. Shots. I don't. Yeah, there's something for lengths of anchor chain or anchor road. So I once worked uh, with a. <laughs> So that's a lot of fathoms. I win this round. That's right, I do. Um, there was, I worked in a uh, research, uh, not a research, for a research librarian, so at, in my university, and uh, a reference librarian. There we go. All my words have come back. Um, <laughs> and we would get uh, the uh, public in, and they would you know, ask us questions, and of course we would go look up things for them. And there was this guy who wanted, oh, what was it? I think he wanted to know how many tons of seawater was in like a cubic mile or something it was like a bunch i had to i had to do deep research to do all of the conversions so like i ended up converting something to like english oil barrels and like a few other like steps and i did get his answer it's like wow it's like you guys check my math like we're not going to So, videographer Aaron, I have a special request for you. It's possible. Depends on what it is. I'm on SPL. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if we could play part of the uh, Nautilus album. Is that available for listening? Absolutely it, not. It is not, no. <laughs> we, uh, we can't do that. Well, if the folks at home didn't know. There's apparently a whole album dedicated to uh, Nautilus songs. Written, they were written some. Some of them are written aboard the ship. Recorded by Dolly Parton's band. I've heard it. They're on YouTube, also. They're on YouTube. Yeah, a couple Ooh, of them. Okay. Not not all of them, but a couple of them. And now that everyone's back from dinner, how many magnets did everyone eat? Not everybody. Megan just left. Just one. <laughs> Megan fan club. Oh, also, Aaron, you missed a jellyfish. Excuse me? I know. <laughs> you just decide to throw salt in the wound? <laughs> Someone in the chat said that they would buy it. Yeah, unfortunately, Aaron is saying that it is technologically impossible. I'm not. I'm not saying it. it's technologically impossible. <laughs> oh, I was. I was trying to help you out. <laughs> I'm. I'm saying we gotta do some science talk. There's, yeah. Yes, yeah, science talk. Uh, and, well, our chat right now is full of um, 
nautical measurements, so I <laughs> don't know how scientific that is. What other nautical measurements are there? Oh, they're talking about chains. So anchor chain length is measured in shots. A shot is 90 feet. And anchor length is, yeah, called a shot. Yep. I'm sure they brought up cables by now. Yeah, that's where that came from. Yeah, okay. Not in the chat, but they're talking about anchor roads. A blue, a, a blue whale unit? Blue whales are a unit. They're not. <laughs> it's like a unit to like measure uh, how much whales, or like how much of a whale, or how many whales you can catch. So, I have, uh, and the answer is probably no, but have you played Katamari Damacy? It's a video game? No. <laughs> so, the concept is ridiculous, but um, you just basically, short, long story short, you're rolling up a bunch of things into one big ball, and you can pause the game and see, it'll tell you like, you are one blue whale large at this point. Oh, okay. interesting. Fascinating. Here, Back to work. Uh, what background and schooling do you need to be an ROV pilot? There's a bunch of different pathways. You guys have time to talk about yours? I did a bachelor's in mechanical engineering at the University of Victoria. Um, my background is actually in computer science and um, marine robotics and computer vision, so kind of a mix. Nice. There you go. There's some very, uh, many, many pathways to doing whatever you'd like to do. Yep, the chat knows what's up with Katsumari Damacy. Thank you. There's only like, I feel like 50 people in the world who have played that game, but it's amazing. On the, on the career note, a really good way, if you're interested in something, is to go on the Teams page and see yeah. which career you're interested in and then go on different people's profiles and see what their education was and what their route was because then there's all different ones you can do. Um, so that's a really good way. If you're interested in how to get on the ship and you have something particular in mind or you just want to explore careers, that's a good way to do it. I'm looking. There's a little, um, what is it called, a quiz to see like what your what career you might be best adapted to at sea, but I'm trying to find it here. I, I never could find the link. I always googled it. Yeah, I like I, they put it on social quiz. media all the time, but I don't know. But uh, you can actually, if you go on nautiluslive.org, uh, just on the home page, um, when you click on our profile images, it will tell you what each of our backgrounds is and our jobs. And there's a uh, another page within, I think it's in the expedition somewhere. Um, no, it's under team. Of course, it's under team. I um, mean, you can look at the uh, backgrounds of everyone working for OET, I believe. Why or at are least you that's on, on the boat. Because <laughs> you're what I clicked. I don't know. I clicked on somebody else first, I think. Maybe. I don't know. Not the one looking up people on Twitter. Uh, ooh, perfect question for you. How do you become a geologist on this program? In this program or in general? This is on the program, I'm guessing, in this in, program. In this, in this place. Um, yeah, so I am working on a project that's funded through OECI, who is funding this particular cruise. So I was able to come on because their whole idea is to try and learn more and characterize the US EEZ. And part in doing that is looking for these marine deposits, uh, ferromanganese crust, which is what I study, um, to kind of learn about more about how they're formed and uh, the distribution of them, because there's a potential to mine them in the future. So that's how I got started. but. I, so I don't know. I probably could have gone to a different school for geology and wouldn't be on this cruise. So, what is the USEEZ? Yeah, so the USEEZ is the exclusive economic zone. So every coastal state uh, gets a exclusive economic zone from the. It's called UNCLOS, but it's the Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it was. This convention that was over a period of time in the 80s 
It went into effect in 1996. And essentially, a bunch of countries came together to try and create international law surrounding the ocean. And one of the things that came out of it was the EEZ. So I think the EEZ is it's 200 nautical miles from uh, your territorial sea or your continental shelf. Uh, that is your EEZ. And you pretty much each coastal state has rights to do kind of whatever they want in there. But you also have to allow things like innocent passage. So you have to let allow people to be able to like pass through your waters um, and stuff like that. You can't restrict things like that. Nice. Navigations, Erin, do you have time for a career question? Uh, yeah, sure. If this person has an undergraduate degree in geography with a certificate in GIS, how much of a jump is it to train as a seafloor mapper? Um, it, I mean, you have the geospatial skills, which is a, a good start, but seafloor mapping is, is about the acoustics and the positioning. So, um, I mean, you could learn quite a lot just in the job, but I found it really helpful to go take some classes on it. So I have a, a master's in ocean mapping, which really focused on, again, the acoustics, the positioning, um, and things like that. So I would say it's a good start. Um, and I know plenty of people who come out as kind of early mappers with that same background, but it would be helpful in the long run to either, um, you don't necessarily have to do advanced degree. Uh, there's a, a multi-beam course that's quite helpful. It's like six days, teaches you a lot. Um, and experience really helps. So hopefully that answers the question, but it's a good start, but it's not quite there. I feel like your job, Aaron, is the one that no one quite knows everything that you do and all the background to it. As far as mapping and nav? Or just yeah, for both of them. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's so much more complex than people think. Sometimes, and sometimes it's like a lot simpler. <laughs> it depends on the day. Uh, NautilusLive.org, um, you can actually look up under the uh, education tab. We have a seafloor mapping uh, internship program. So you can apply for that as well. You should definitely do the internship program if you, if you can, because a lot of us have done it, and that's how we, we got on board. Writing the... Geology coaster. Oh man, my brain's still catching up here. Um, if we mine them, what are feral mang fer ferromanganese crusts used for? Yeah, so um, ferromanganese crusts are thought to be really enriched in certain uh, metals and rare earth elements um, that are of economic importance. So a big one is cobalt. Um, actually, another name, I guess, I can't believe I've never seen, said this before. I call them ferromanganese crusts, but another name for them is cobalt crust or cobalt-rich crusts, um, which is what they were called in the beginning. And cobalt's a really important element because it's getting kind of depleted on land, and how we mine them on land is a little bit of a humanitarian issue because most of it comes, or 70% of it comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where you can imagine, you know, working conditions are really harsh and wages are bad and there's no security for them. Um, but we need things like cobalt for any sort of electric device. So computers, uh, renewable energies, electric vehicles, and yeah. So if you want cell phones. Yeah, if you want cell phones, you need cobalt. We need those metals. Not necessarily from the deep sea, but we need those metals in general. Is that a jelly? Oh, see the seafloor. I see the bottom. Seafloor, yay. Are we touching down here, or are we still going to coast? Uh, Bridge Nav, you can hold position there. Thank you.
while our front row does their thing, Coralie, are there other, other metals in the uh, ferromanganese crust besides cobalt that are of economic importance? Yeah, there's a bunch. So nickel, copper, manganese, iron, just to name a few. There, um, if you guys know what rare earth elements are, it's like this line in the periodic table um, of elements. It goes from like lanthanum to, oh my gosh, I can't remember. Something else, let me look it up. Uh, you don't have the super... periodic table memorized? Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm sorry. I just memorized the chunks that I used all the time. <laughs> I haven't had to use it in a long time. Uh, but they're super enriched in these rare earth elements, which is pretty cool. Because compared to Earth's crust, they're super, super enriched. They're also really enriched in cerium, um, which is interesting because if you look at the rare earth plot of seawater cerium super depleted in the seawater but it's super enriched in these crusts so it's kind of like you can tell where they're going to where the yeah are they going. actively pulling them out of the seawater yeah yeah that's what the crusts do so uh there's two forms that crust can take on so there's like a manganese oxide phase and an iron oxyhydroxide phase and manganese oxide are strongly negative and are they're strongly negative ions and then iron oxyhydroxides are weakly positive and so they'll scavenge oppositely charged metal ions in the water lock them into place in these crusts so that's how we get them looks like we've found land land ho Oh, I want to give a shout out to my roommates, oh my, my mucus roommate, no. and the other one who are listening right now. <laughs> Thanks for listening to us. Um, so I keep saying this is the Lu'ua Ea Hiki Ke Kai expedition because somebody just asked how to pronounce that. So the trick is that um, they basically mushed a bunch of words into one word. So it's Lu'ua Ea A. Hiki, E, K, Kualono, Kai. Can I zoom on that thing? Hey. Yeah. It's called a Munopsid isopod. It's one of the swimming isopods. Take a screen grab. Good zooming. The isopod. Oh, just drifted out. All right, folks. We're gonna go two two zero for a bit. Start marching up slope. You ready? All right. There was a originally a plan to take another rock sample when we got to this side at about uh, twenty seven hundred meters. So twenty seven hundred, Roger. Yeah, thereabouts. Okay. What's that up there? It's a fish. On the right, right can corner. We, can we look at the fish first? Is that allowed? 